Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 30. As always, I am the Mark. Big the big 3-0. The big 3-0. 30 is the new... 25? Maybe? I don't know. Or is it supposed to go the other way? No, it's supposed to go down. If, wait, no. I have no idea. I, I've lost I've it. I've heard now. it both ways. You've heard it both ways. <laughs> Here with me today is Matt. Hey, hey. And we've got Orion all the way on the other side of the country because of work things. Hello from Seattle. Seattle, that's where you are. I forgot. You so, were in Vegas for a little while. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound like work. I was. I will send you a picture of this enormous conference we were in. There was, it was crazy. Yeah, I heard there was lots of They showed of a picture of the conjoined squares of success, which was just brilliant. Did they actually call it the conjoined squares of success? He literally said conjoined squares of success. It had to be the re- a reference, right? I it must be right. <laughs> I would hope I, I, so. I shudder to think that it wasn't, but <laughs> that image you showed me—they were not squares. They were conjoined. Well, they're squares. like puzzle pieces. Oh, that's true. They were puzzle pieces. Yeah, but they were even like mouse-shaped puzzle pieces. Anyway, what are our conjoined squares of success? It's conjoined. Conjoined. Conjoined, not conjoined. Not conjoined. Is co-joined a word? That's how it's spelled, right? No, there's an N. If I had squares of success, I'd be more successful, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe you need to come up with a new theory like the hexagons of success. The hexagonal yes. conjoined That's hexagons their, of success. That is their problem, Orion. Well, then I have to think of at least seven, right? Yeah, you can just have with squares. You could have two, three, maybe four. It seems logical. You don't have to make a hexagon of hexagons. So a more. super hexagon. Well, if what you are will. you making? Just three hexagons? I guess three would look fairly symmetrical. It would be symmetrical. Shh. It but would it also would, look symmetrical. It would look symmetrical. <laughs> <laughs> because it is symmetrical. Oh my goodness. So, Mark, I know that you just want to talk playoff hockey. On this podcast, which is I understandable. I forgot that was happening. I mean, Vegas, great story. Made the second round. Penguins, second round against the Caps for the 30th year in a row. But we should probably talk baseball a little bit. No, I think uh, we're good. How have our favorite teams been doing recently? I think they're about of equal success at the moment. Yeah? Somewhere close I, to there. I saw that the, the Pirates won, swept their series recently. Yeah, yeah. They had some, I who some they were good playing. luck. I think it was St. Louis. I think it was St. Louis. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Cardinals came into that series ahead in the in the division. So. so that's a good way to quickly not be ahead. It's fine. It's early in the season. Yeah. You just need to get a defense. That's what that was the big a defense and a bullpen, and are good hitters to hit well. That's all. <laughs> Our, like, middle-of-the-road hitters are doing <laughs> pretty well. Pirates have started well, so I'm going to get all my shots in on, before they tank. on the Cardinals before they completely fall apart, as we yeah. know that they're going to do. Yeah, because they have no one. They've traded away all their good players. Although, their rookie pitcher the other day, first appearance ever, held a perfect game through six and two-thirds. How, how likely is that? Like, how often does that sort of thing happen? Through six and two-thirds? I don't know. Like... A perfect game has only been done 20-something times ever. Okay, yeah. I imagine a couple times a year someone pulls it into the seventh inning. Maybe more, maybe a handful of times. The announcers kept mocking their data or, like, scouting people on their team because they're like, we were told his his breaking ball was inconsistent and he kept striking out people with his <laughs> breaking ball. It was really good. <laughs> Wes is not appreciating our uh, traditional now. Now it's a tradition. You've done it like four podcasts in a row. What's that? Stir- Just immediately like, oh, Mark, what about hockey? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, apparently people want to talk about board games. It's I'm, I don't know why. And it's called The Thoughtful Gamer. Hockey's a game. Wes asked me why I've Good allowed you to do this. Game. It's the best game you can play. Is that an actual song? Yeah, that's like the classic. Is that the take me out to the ball game of hockey? <laughs> yes, it is. I could have written those <laughs> lyrics. You could have hockey or the baseball one's no better. Yeah, take it's not a great song. Wes, I I've resigned myself to the fact that hockey is going to be brought up. I I'm just letting it happen. 
Some may say Stockholm Syndrome. Anyway, we're here to talk about board games. And today we're going to be talking about dry board games. Board games that we may like or dislike, but board games that are considered to be dry. And this came up in a discussion on our Discord channel, I believe, with some of the uh, Patreon supporters of The Thoughtful Gamer. I don't remember how it came up, but we got on this idea of dry games and then quickly realized that all of us had subtly different definitions of what a dry game is, which I, being the nerd that I am, find very, very interesting. What's more interesting? I believe your first comment was, I need to go do some research about this. And I did do some research and I went on Board Game Geek and Board Game Geek has a definition of dry game. And it's something like overly mathematical and lacking in theme, which is probably a pretty neutral definition of it. But I found some forum discussions and literally no one has the same definition of dry as it comes to board games. Now, of course, there are the many jokes that have been produced from this concept, such as Forbidden Desert being a very dry game, Viticulture not being a dry game at all. Wait, I thought Viticulture was dry. No, it's not, it's not a dry game. It has alcohol all, all over it. Yeah, but I mean, well, I guess it depends whether you're making red wine or white wine. Neither of them are dry. What? You could have a dry white. That's a thing. Oh, gosh. Now that, no, but guess which one of us knows about wine. Words have many meanings. <laughs> we will use some of them. Which is something that I think is kind of the meta topic of this podcast, right? Because I am very much not a language prescriptivist. Like, there's no one who has come down from on high and said this is the definition of the word dry or the many definitions of the word dry depending on context words get their meaning from use and that can change over time and that changes through use and i think this and i don't know much about linguistics like maybe there's a name for this kind of thing but i think with dry in regards to board games it's kind of a term that has a vaguely similar meaning to board gamers But when you ask them about it, they all give very slightly different meanings that can be that can that can kind of radically change what games would be classified as dry. So I think that's a a very interesting subject just from a perspective of language, but also talking about board games and what it means to be a dry board game. That said, I want and I kind of boiled it down to four different general definitions of dry other than not wet or you know whatever other literal joke definitions that uh, you might have so the first one is dry as not exciting so a dry game would be a game that does not produce excitement so not like the resistance or i don't know what's another very exciting game twilight imperium is exciting or you know combat games kemet Downforce would be a game that produces a lot of excitement. So a dry game in that sense would be one that creates situations in which people don't get excited at all. They kind of just sit there and play the game and do their thing playing it. Castles of Burgundy honestly fits all of the definitions. (laughs) I think that is the prototypical dry board game. The The next definition, which is the one that I tend to use, I suppose, when I say the word dry... And the one that Matt hates is that a dry game is one that is not thematic. So we talk about theme a lot in board games. And I specifically would argue that a thematic game is a game in which the mechanics of the game and the theme are interrelated. I think that is a thematic experience. And I would say dry is the opposite of that. So it's a game in which the theme really could be anything and you wouldn't need to change anything except for the art would be a dry game to me the next definition which is kind of you know these kind of overlap is that a dry game is one that is very mathematical so one in which you're thinking a lot about calculation and math and those kinds of some people would argue dour topics some people would argue very exciting topics but games in which you're doing a lot of calculation and then finally the one that orion brought up in our discussions before the podcast is a dry game as one in which you are not incentivized to role play within the theme where you're not incentivized to think in terms of your perspective in the game 
your perspective of the theme. So your your agency within the storyline or something like that. And I think it's interesting that we have all these different kinds of concepts, but it's very, very difficult to nail down. I don't know. What do you guys think of these four definitions? Can you think of others? I think I got everything from our discussion before the podcast the other day. Yeah, this is a good this is a good list. Um, I think Orion's definition of not incentivizing role play in decision making. I think that's closest to what I was originally thinking. I like the mathematical definition, and I think I think not thematic captures what a lot of people think of dry as. Why would you prefer Orion's definition? That's what I'm really curious yeah. about. Dry as not thematic. I don't particularly like that because that just puts it dry is just a marker on the axis of theme, which isn't really useful. I, I I don't know. I guess I would see maybe abstract on that axis. But so, I would argue a pur- purely abstract game is a dry game. Like by they definition. They usually are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. I, I mean, I think they're related ideas. It's just, are they on the same axis or are they on kind of not quite parallel lines? I like the concept of, well, I like my definition because I'm biased towards myself, but also because, like Matt said, it kind of creates another axis to consider a game on because yeah it i think you can have thematic games where you are very much mathing it out and you can be playing in this rich you know fantasy universe or some cool sci-fi universe and still be mathing it out and the that just kind of having another dimension to consider games on makes it a more interesting discussion even if it's not the most precise definition yeah the two games that came up in my mind very quickly in this discussion I think illustrate the difference are Twilight Imperium and Twilight Struggle, where I think they're both incredibly thematic games, but I think that Twilight Imperium kind of incentivizes you to role play. Your powers are aligned with your race, and you kind of take on a persona in that diplomatic space where everyone's playing. Whereas Twilight Struggle is this Cold War theme where it's just it, it's very cut and dry the decisions are are very calculated and and you're not really rule playing your decisions yeah but i i disagree that that's part of twilight struggle i think in twilight struggle it's remarkable how close you're getting to kind of the real politic thinking of the actors in the cold war i think There's the perception that it's more dry because of the artwork and because it's a real life setting and not a fantasy setting. But the main difference between the two games in that sense, I think, is just the nature of the multiplayer diplomacy in Twilight Imperium. And I don't think that's something that necessarily would draw a distinction between a dry game and a not dry game. I think it might be. I mean, by by nature, a, a game that's diplomatic... A game that's diplomatic is not going to be cut and dry. It's all about the subtle interact interactions with people, and nothing is quite what it seems. Kind of on a player to player relationship. I think another one that we kind of discussed as being a dry but thematic game of was Agricola, in that you kind of feel this tension of struggling to survive, but at the same time you're very much just picking the most efficient action or choosing a path towards feeding your family and scoring the most points. Yeah, it's something I didn't write in the notes also that factors into this is CCG games, which often are very thematic. My preference is Netrunner, and that's insanely thematic in terms of the, the cat and mouse game between the runner and the corporation. But even Magic the Gathering, you can imagine, you know, as you're playing the game that you're summoning these giant creatures and battling on a battlefield. But... Uh, except at the very ca- most casual levels, you're doing a lot of kind of dry calculation in those games. Yeah. And I still, th- I, w- I wouldn't classify, and I don't think most people would classify those as dry experiences, even though you end up calculating as much as you would in any Euro or Twilight Struggle or something like that. To me, that is kind of the epitome of a game that's not dry at all, that the The kind of things you're doing in the calculations are what your character or agent or actor or whatever would be doing within that theme is the opposite of dry. What you were saying up until the point where you said 
the things you're doing are what your character would be doing. Up until that point, I agreed 100%. But, like, when you play Magic, do you put yourself in the role of, like, a a spell caster? I don't even... Not I've so played, much I've with Magic, but I know, I know Wes, he told me once when he plays Magic, he imagines all the visuals like that. Like, he finds it super evocative of the theme. It, yeah, and it's... I think that's cool, but even when you're imagining that, like, that's so disconnected from the gameplay. In Magic, it is more so than Netrunner. In Netrunner, it's so closely aligned but to me it's the idea of the choices that you are presented to you being the same kind of choices that someone that that your actor in the game would be faced with in that fantasy situation if it were playing out that's the opposite of a of a dry game that is like the most thematic game whereas a dry game is when you're presented with choices but it could be you know it could be anything like it could be any context, any setting, and those kinds of choices in that situation really wouldn't matter. It just ends up being math in the end. Maybe where I disagree is how we evaluate what it's like to be in the place of your character, the game. Because I don't see that in Netrunner. Like I think thematically it's cool and I can imagine that kind of narrative or you know playing the movie of the experience alongside the game that's being played. But the things you're doing are not what real people do. They're not what hackers do. They're what the fantasy hackers do, where you actually, like, jack into a system and encounter these, like, AI representations of firewalls in cyberspace, which can punish you in various ways. That's part of the fantasy lore of Netrunner. Yeah. Anyway, that's my argument for saying that it's kind of the opposite of thematic. Like, I don't, I don't understand why it's a bad thing to have it be the opposite side of that scale. It's not a bad thing. It's less interesting. It's like having two words that mean the same thing. But what's the other yeah. word we would use? I non-thematic? Think, I, think, I, think abs- I think non-thematic. I mean, really, theme. You can measure theme from zero up. You don't have negative theme. You don't really need anything on the other side of that axis. But I would say that abstract is closer to the other side of that. Yeah, that's fair. Maybe maybe the idea of dry then is that it ostensibly has a theme but fails at it. I think... I think maybe that's okay. what I'm getting at. So, so I think my original definition when we were talking, I think I, I talked about emotion. To me, a dry game is one that doesn't elicit emotion connected with the decisions that you're making. So... That's where I get this idea of cold and calculated. But but by emotion, you mean like thematic emotion, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because, you, again, you can imagine, yeah, you know, because... a competitive chess game, you know, you would have lots of emotions Absolutely. there. But they're not related to the idea of like warfare, like medieval warfare. Yeah. I think that's not bad at all. That's clear cut. And, and here's the thing also that I find interesting about this discussion is that, you know, obviously we're saying there are many... You could use the word dry in many different ways, but in some senses, you can argue for a particular definition being more useful, which is kind of what I want to get at here. And I think that's pretty useful because I think it communicates the idea that most people would have with the word, and it it communicates it clearly with kind of a good bright line of when is something clearly not dry or when is something clearly dry. That's not bad. Uh, Joshua in the chat highlights Mage Knight as an interesting case, which I know is your favorite game, Matt. It's fine. (laughs) A game which has tons of theme in that it has lots of fancy artwork and kind of a backstory and a bunch of different characters with special abilities. But over the course of the game, you're really playing kind of a tight mathematical optimization puzzle, which is, I think, where a lot of your criticism comes from. Yeah, but in that case, too, like, I can play that tight optimization puzzle every turn. And there's this grand kind of epic movie narrative that plays, you know, beside it. But the two really aren't connected. Like, I'm not yeah. I'm not putting myself into that narrative. I'm not feeling the narrative. And then, but I can still picture it. And, and both are cool. But they're different. And I might call that dry. Yeah, yeah. You might, you might say that. And then you shift over to something like Spirit Island, which has an equal amount of impressive art and a lot of similar card play, but it does more to 
kind of differentiate the different spirits. And I think you feel the theme more and you make decisions according and, to like, the theme uh, more. Uh, oh, Ryan, des- describe the ocean thing that you played on Spirit Island. Ocean's Hungry Grasp? Yeah, when you were playing that, like, those are robust mechanics, but you really feel like the ocean in the decisions you make, right? Yeah, I think, actually, that's a game that has become almost more thematic to me the more I've played it, in that I kind of see how the limitations or powers of different races kind of almost craft a personality to them, or kind of outline a personality, maybe, and then... Just kind of imagining how, you know, the ocean, the tide comes in and you push your presence onto the island and you drown stuff and then you have to send the tide back out to recover your cards. And Yeah, I think that's cool. an example of something It does a lot of little things better than Mage Knight to bring you into the theme more. And that's, you know, part of the reason why it's so brilliant. Remind me, what was the definition we're working with here? A, a game that is not dry is one in which you feel the emotions of the theme. Yeah, that's not a, those aren't exactly the words I use, but yes, that that's the idea. It, it, yeah, yeah. What the idea you, that you 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 feel the emotions of the theme with the decisions. What do you think of that one, Orion? I think that's good. I think that's kind of along the line of I was trying to get to, and that like in Twilight Imperium, I'm immersed in the game and making decisions along with the theme. You yeah, know, your, or, your definition being dry is not incentivized to role play. Right. Yeah, and it lands somewhere kind of in the middle of the definitions I had going into this. Let's look at some case studies then, because I think using this definition and see what we can do with different games. The first couple games that I thought of were Twilight Struggle, which we already talked about in Agricola, in that they're both very complicated, thinky, almost mathematical games with a very high connection between the theme and the mechanisms of the game. Now, I would think that under this kind of working definition that those would not be dry at all, which is what my impression would be of those games. Which is interesting because I immediately put Twilight Struggle in the dry category. Well, and then in our discussions, Bubba was saying that Agricola is incredibly dry for him. Which I think raises an interesting point in that as we kind of define dry or wet, if you will, as how immersed you are in the theme of making decisions that varies from person to person and how you experience a game. So a game that for you is, you'd might call more on the dry side, someone like Wes might call it more wet or whatever, because (laughs) he experiences or plays the game differently. Right, right. Which I guess is if we're getting very precise about it, then, you know, obviously there's a lot of subjectivity in there, but you might say a dry game will be a game in which more a larger percentage of people who play the game don't feel the emotions of the theme. Right? Yeah, so and, and I think also curve. in this definition we're working with, dryness is a more subjective thing than theme. Well, that's almost an entirely different thing. And this is something I think I've ranted about somewhere. I don't remember if it was on the podcast or in an article, but I really, really think, like I said before, that theme properly understood as an asset to understand like, okay, what are we aiming for when we're looking at a thematic game? Right. Is one in which the mechanisms and the the narrative of the game are highly connected. Whereas I think a lot of people in the board game space, when they say a thematic game where they say, you know, has a lot of theme, they're talking about a lot of flashiness, a lot of artwork. Some people love the miniatures, but some people love, you know, just really nice artwork. Or kind of a setting, I guess, or like a heavily, usually fantastical setting. Whereas to me, like the idea of Agricola, where you're doing sustenance farming, or food chain magnate, where you're where you're operating fast food franchises in a very very strange town, like those are just as evocative as an idea, as a setting, as any fantasy setting is going to be. But yeah. you know, a lot of yeah. people don't think the same way and the effectiveness of the the theme is in how the mechanics of the game are integrated with that that theme right so to me when you're you're saying is a game good at being thematic you're looking at that you're not looking necessarily at the narrative josh in the chat points out yeah it's about immersion in the theme rather than i think the existence of the theme i think you might also measure kind of the opposite of this and like the amount of dissonance between 
how thematic the game is and how much that impacts your decision, the the more dissonance, maybe the less good of a game it is. Yeah, I don't know if I would want to be yeah. that yeah, I don't know. generalizing with it, but I think there's something that's taken away with that dissonance, which is an interesting point because like yeah. you can imagine two games, one or two games with the same mechanisms, but one shoots for a much more high concept theme, but doesn't apply the mechanisms to the theme. Like which of those two games is better or worse? I might argue that the one that has the more modest aims thematically ends up being the better game because it doesn't have that dissonance. So I think it's an interesting variable or, or, or kind of, thing to think about when you're evaluating a game that's a good point we we got derailed from some train of thought my train of thought has been straight down it's been great okay okay i'm <laughs> glad that you're on we'll just <laughs> all right so bringing this back around to agricola and twilight struggle i think we can agree that generally they would be not a dry game is, is that the conclusion well, we're coming to i i should say i've played a lot less twilight struggle than you which you've only played the once right I've only played a full game once, so this might actually get at something else. When we're talking generally about these themes of theme and dryness, we have to consider how the player's coming to the game. So if the player's only played the game once, maybe they don't experience that integration with the, with the setting. Yeah, yeah, the no, that's in the same way. So like when I played Twilight Struggle, it was this. I, I mean, I got the theme in that it was just constant dread. Everything you did was bad and you're just trying to do the least bad thing. But the actual gameplay experience for me was just like pushing numbers and just trying to, which I would describe as dry. But may, maybe, yeah, on the fifth play, maybe I experienced that differently. Can you put into words what I'm... Yeah, no, no, no I there? think that's true. And that's going to be true of any game as you get more into the game Th this one might be a almost an opposite example of most games where most games as you become better at them you think of them less in terms of the theme yeah in twilight struggle maybe you understand it even even more deeply okay let, let's be precise here are we talking about theme here or are we talking with our definition of dryness being in... an emotional attachment to the dis to the decisions i think in this case both actually yeah okay because I, I think Twilight Struggle is extremely thematic, and you get the experience of this, you know, the struggle, but I don't know if I would call it, I would I would lean almost more to the dry side of the decisions being very much, like, when I have a hand, it's, it's very much an optimization puzzle, and I don't have an emotional attachment to one card being the Korean War or something. Yes, but it's still, even in, in like, super high-level play, it's about managing crises that are you know, that pop up out of your control, which is, I think, the deeper thematic connection, that that's kind of the Cold War thing, is that, you know, there's all this geopolitics happening and you're trying to mitigate the damage from that as much as possible and gain where you can. And, of course, Twilight Struggle's, I think, a unique case because it's so well done in that regard. But the general point, I think, still stands that it does immerse you in that aspect of the theme, even if you're not as immersed in the specifics of what the cards are historically. It's still creating situations in which the pressures put on you are the similar kinds of pressures that someone who was, you know, you, managing. You talked earlier, what was the, the line that you used? The, the high concept theme? Sure. I feel like Twilight Struggle nails the high concept theme. And like the game experience as a whole mirrors the theme of the Cold War so well. It's more in the, the details of decision making that I don't connect the theme as strongly, uh, which I think is kind of what you're saying. Yeah, and, 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 and no and, game's really going to do that. And that's what I call, uh, that's kind of what I call dry. In a sense, there's an emotional arc to a game of Twilight Struggle where, yeah, it is the, it is the Cold War and you feel that. But I don't necessarily feel that emotion when I'm picking a card to play from my hand. And Agricola kind of falls into that same category, perhaps, for me. Whereas, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the example I originally used of Twilight Imperium is one where when I decide to invade my neighbor, I feel that as, you know, the space lions. I mean, there's a calculating nature to that decision. Mm -hmm. I'm weighing the, the risk reward about invading my neighbor's space. But as I make that decision, I can role play it and math it out at the same time. 
So it's at the decision level, I'm emotionally connected. That's fair. Yeah, no, that, that's a fair point. I'll agree with that one. Let's look at a couple of other examples. I think we can all agree, and I think as I was thinking about this topic and preparing for it, that immediately my first thought was, okay, the quintessential dry game is Castles of Burgundy, which I love and adore, but there's there's literally no relation between the theme and what you're doing. Like, it's, Yeah, I agree. It's essentially an abstract game. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in this case, the theme is not overpowering. It's just kind of background. It's just some art to yeah, play your time Yeah, so to your dissonance point, it doesn't really have that distance. Exactly. It's a, it's a really mild kind of benign yeah, I've, setting. I've never been halfway through a game of Castles of Burgundy and been like, man, the kingdom planner in me really wants to fill in this hexagon, but the better decision is to fill in a different hexagon. I've never said that. Never had that. Whereas, it, whereas in like say suburbia, sometimes you're like, oh man, I can't put this trash heap next to the residential neighborhood. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a great example. And yeah. in that case, it's again, there's a strong alignment because there's going to be some penalty for putting the trash heap next to the residential. Though ultimately, it may be a good move, but it creates those incentives that are kind of in line with the theme. That's a great comparison. I didn't even think of that. So we're saying that suburbia is wet, castles of Burgundy is dry. Less, I, <laughs> uh, least, games, relative to castles of Burgundy, suburbia is definitely wet. Sounds soggy, so gross, to moist, me. moist. Oh, ah. I'm not even one of those people that hates the word moist, but <laughs> damp. Like I, I think of a wet burrito is the thing. I don't know what. <laughs> How I get to that. <laughs> Why do you ever think of a wet burrito? <laughs> no, a wet burrito is when you put hot sauce on top of the burrito. That's called a wet burrito. On top of the burrito. Yeah, so if you can order it, you go to a Isn't lot of Mexican places. Enchilada? No, I mean, it's bigger than an enchilada. Enchiladas are usually made with smaller tortillas. But it, it ends up being similar to an enchilada, yeah. But no, you go to a lot of places, you order your burrito wet, they'll put hot sauce and cheese on top. Oh, look at this. The first synonym for wet, thethoris.com. Dank. <laughs> <laughs> so we're saying the opposite of a dry game is a dank game? That's what... Thesaurus.com. Yes. Says. Well, that's an authority, so I guess we're running with that. Humid, muggy, slippery. Dripping with theme. Dri oh, I hate dripping with theme. <laughs> the Dice Tower people say that all the time. I'm like, what is it dripping with? Why is theme. it theme, Mark? Is theme a liquid? Is it some kind of gelatinous substance? A non Newtonian fluid? Yeah, I think so. Okay. That's what it is. Aqueous. Aqueous. <laughs> Wouldn't that be dissolved in theme? <laughs> All right. Now we're actually off track. Where was I going? Okay. Suburbia. <laughs> Suburbia. So that's okay. That's a great comparison there, great I think. Game. Here's the most interesting game I thought of, and that is Santorini which I find a very intriguing game because it's an abstract game that they desperately tried to make thematic. But to me, it ends up being very, very dry, even though it looks cool and it's got that really unique aesthetic and it has all these special powers. I've played that one with I, you, right? Yeah, yeah, you yeah, played yeah it. just played once, but I think it's a perfect example for what we're talking about. Yeah, I think to me, even though a lot of and a lot of people are praising it, I think, for being very thematic. But I think what they mean is that it looks really cool, which it does. Yeah, it looks cool. But to me, there's no emotion related to the yeah, theme so, at like, all. The Poseidon power, it's like if you have Poseidon, you're not like, oh, clearly I get to build twice. That just That's exactly Poseidon. Is that what the Poseidon one was? I don't know. I made yeah. that up. But yeah. In my... I don't think... That, I, I assume there's a Poseidon in the game, but I don't think it has anything to do with yeah. the ocean. Yeah, so in Santorini, you're... You're building towers, like you're like some Greek architects or something, right? Is that I the think theme? The, maybe the most thematic one is like Mars that lets you either destroy someone's peace or something like that. Yeah, it might have stuff like that, but, but then it's... that's like those those are the exceptions, and most of them are just like here's a Greek god and here's a power. <laughs> yeah, but this could easily and... have been stacking cubes, and I believe at one point the game was built with wooden components like that. Really? Yeah. I believe there so. Go. There was like a very, very early version I found online. You, you could, could also change the theme and keep the same powers. Oh, yeah. It could be so many things. 
could be stacking boxes. So this is a case where <laughs> cats. I don't know. I don't know. Stack if, I don't know how if, if they are really trying Snowman. to push the theme that much. Because I don't think of it as a thematic game. I think of it as an abstract game, and I enjoy it because I ignore whatever theme they may have been trying to shove into yeah. it. Yeah, I think I think that's fine. Yeah, but I mean, I think... I think chess is very similar. I mean, we don't even think of the theme of chess, but it's there. I mean, it's two battling kingdoms coming head to head. Sure. Yeah. I mean, really, it's thematic in a similar way that Santorini is. And that's fine. And, there, and there's stories about like ancient kings or whatever reconciling things like losing their prince or whatever by playing chess and having to play a peace sacrifice to win the game. Yeah. And I, I, there's stories about people like gaining perspective on that sort of real life situation by yeah. playing chess and have, running into that sort of situation in the game. It maybe chess nails that high concept theme idea, but it's like really disconnected from the actual play. Yeah. Also, I remember when we were watching when the the Alpha Go uh, Go tournament against whatever the champion was named, um, Sedong and Lee Sedong. Yeah, Lil Sedong or something, something like, like that. that yeah. Lee Sedong, something like that. But like the commentators were talking about it with like this reverence of like this move and they had a very emotional connection to the different moves that you might make and the patterns that you're looking for. And to them, it was, it became like the theme of trying to surround the other pieces became much more real. And that was, that was really cool to see. Yeah. Yeah. It was really cool. You know, cause those are people who dedicated their lives to the game. I remember one particular move that they were, you know, they had time to look over it for like 20, 30 minutes and they came to con the conclusion that like books would be written about that move. And I'm like, Oh man, <laughs> that's, that's crazy watching this, you know, watching this commentary on, on such an important game because it ended up being some critical move for the, for AlphaGo's victory, but it was something that they wouldn't have even considered, I think is what the expert was talking about. And then throughout the 20 minutes of him analyzing this move, he started to realize that I might have actually been really brilliant. And it ended up being really, really good. Which is an interesting thing because... And I've read similar things about chess and specifically, and I know it's, there's similar things for Go, where it's not just this reverence because they've played the game their whole lives. It's because fundamentally games like that that are really, really tightly constructed actually do illustrate important decision lessons that you come across in real life really well and ways of thinking correctly and avoiding like cognitive errors games that can go very very deep like that even end up emerging kind of on the other side as this like cognitive life lesson <laughs> yeah yeah which i don't know if that's connected to the idea of dryness or thing but i find it such a fascinating topic to to consider yeah, just running with that for a second, I've been watching more StarCraft recently, and there's some of the commentators have been playing and or casting StarCraft for 20 years now since it came out. Basically, you know, their entire lives, they grew up with the game, and they talk a lot about how the stress and the, like, crisis management and instant decision-making under pressure and having to live with your mistakes and the very competitive nature really forces you to learn those sort of life skills of how to deal with conflict and how to make decisions and evaluate things and how to lose and talking about that as being really valuable to them and some of the other longtime players. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, it's a wonderful aspect of games. Now I think we've actually gone off on a, on a rabbit trail, but pulling this back to Santorini, I think we're all in agreement here that that is not a dank game even though it really <laughs> wants to be and i think i haven't written my review of santorini but i think as of right now it's going to rate lower than onitama which is another abstract game i got about the same time and i think part of the reason is because it has that that cognitive dissonance that orion was talking about earlier because it tries so desperately to be a thematic game when it really isn't yeah speaking of cognitive dissonance <laughs> you've got a couple more here Shadows over Camelot and Merlin. Yeah, which I just now realized 
which goes to show how well I prep for these podcasts. They have very similar themes. <laughs> which wow. Is, which is Arthurian. You, you really have to be an autopilot to not catch that. But here, I think, are two games that, again, are heavily thematic. But to me, the decisions you make in the game and the emotions you feel are kind of completely different. With Shadows over Camelot, uh, especially with the possibility of a traitor, obviously you have all the emotions and all the decision points related to that. But I don't know. Is there something in Arthurian legend dealing with a traitor amongst the round table? Oh, right. I, I actually, Surely you know the Arthurian um, legend the th- best there, there's, among us. There's stories about kind of as time went on, they fell out of favor with each other. Like... Arthur or what's Lancelot slept with what's his uh, Arthur's wife so there's like a whole thing about that I don't know if there's a specific traitor in the ranks that I can think of the emotions that you're you have as a result of the game large part have to do with kind of the group you're playing with whether or not you get into the old the whole like Monty Python quoting or whatever and the traitor mechanism but to me there's not a lot of relationship between Arthurian roundtable people going out and accomplishing things and the whole traitor thing. Like, there, there are, like, multiple disconnects on the way down. And I don't think it's the driest game in the world, but I think it's an example of a game that tries for a very strong theme but doesn't actually accomplish it very well. And that's yes. just because the actions you do are playing a one or playing a two. So, I don't know. We have a lot of different axes going here, I think. I think this game is very thematic, but it doesn't implement the theme into the gameplay well. And I wouldn't, I don't think it's dry. I think it's moderately dry. And I think we're all in agreement that it's not a very good game. Yeah, I mean, moderately well, dry. Well, let's compare it to its closest relative, you, you might say, in the board game world, which is Battlestar Galactica, yeah. where I think a lot of the mechanisms that they change there force you into decisions like the characters on the show, specifically with the way how yeah. crises are done. Yeah. In and that everyone's trying to contribute, but you you know it's too much of a crisis to actually understand how much everyone else is contributing, so you play the cards face down. So I, I feel like emotionally you're connected both to the grander arc of Battlestar Galactica and to every decision that you make. Right. You're in the character. Whereas in Shadows, you kind of have the grand narrative is decent, but the actual decisions or non-decisions you make during the game of, like, playing yeah. a card down. You're neither emotionally connected to those decisions, nor are those decisions well connected to the theme. Yeah. And then the other one I brought up is Merlin, which is kind of an example that Orion and I played, which is, a, again, a Feld game like Castles of Burgundy, but has a large thematic dissonance that Castles of Burgundy simply doesn't have because, you know, Burgundy has such a kind of dull theme to begin with. But I thought when I was playing Merlin, I just wanted more to happen because it's about getting the favor of different factions in in manipulating, you know, getting Merlin's favor in different things. But it ends up being kind of a gaining one or two points of play kind of game like Burgundy. Did you did you get that that dissonance feeling from it, Oran? Yeah, I mean, like I wanted there was all this cool stuff sitting on the board and you couldn't really interact with it as much as you wanted to. And your decisions were just rolling dice and then, you know, which order do I play them in? <laughs> yeah, and there was nothing so it connected. Just re- it removes so much of your decision making that I think it creates that sort of distance from the theme so that uh, otherwise making a decision to get a building material might be more impactful. But when it was just, well, I landed on this space, so I guess that's what I get. Right. And, and it was also there was the the differentiation between the what six or seven factions on the board that you're trying to curry favor with there was some distinction between them but it didn't make any thematic sense it was just six factions it wasn't whatever the yeah. names were it was, and the, the only the only difference different. was uh like what power the flag gave you i think yeah and another point to the dissonance is that it was so visually busy and there's kind of a lot going on there. I at least ended up being slightly disappointed that there just wasn't more swinginess or bigger effects or anything like that. You yeah. could combo some of the cards a bit, but there wasn't much else. 
another game that I kind of just thought of was um, Tzolkin, which I would I don't know how thematic it is. It's very visually stimulating, but in that case, your decisions are much more impactful, and then you get to you you have a very emotional connection because you kind of see these gears going around, and you're trying to get certain actions, and and then there's also a huge computational factor in or ordering your actions. Is there, and uh, you guys sequences. have played more to Zulka than I have, but is there an emotional connection? Because my my instinct would be that that's I don't a know, very, maybe not. But that, that's a oh no, I don't game. think that's an interesting case because. I think it's a very dry game. I think it's an excellent game, but I think it's very dry because it's so computational and there's nothing yeah. really connecting you emotionally to the theme. But it doesn't bother me because it's executed so vividly and so interestingly. Yeah. So is that a situation and in which it's just executed mechanically so interesting that we get past that it doesn't have a lot of relation to the theme? Well, I think the theme is fine and that's okay. Like, the whole Mayan thing, and the resources are all Mayan civilization related. Maybe that's it. That maybe there's it's enough... All fine. Maybe there's enough component-wise to connect yeah, I wouldn't the two call things, because you have the little skulls, you have the different gods. I wouldn't call it a very, like, a highly thematic game, but I think that the theme is serviceable to what the game is. So using the same language that I've been using... I don't think you have an emotional connection to the theme on either the grand scale or the kind of decision to decision level in Tzolkin. So the theme just kind of serves. Oh, I completely the thing. agree. I completely agree. Yeah. I think it's right. The question I'm asking is, though, because it has kind of such a rich attempt at a theme, but it ends up being very dry. Why don't we? Why don't we experience that I, but, dissonance? Uh, but I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that it's a. I would say that it is exactly serviceable. It is a good theme. It, it, it's a good skin for the game, and 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 for that game, that's that's what the mechanics needed. Okay, so you're saying it's closer to like Castles of Burgundy, where it's just it is a theme and it doesn't get in the way very sure. much. Sure, I think okay. Zulkin does a better job. You know, I, sometimes it's hard to actually put a theme on a set of mechanics, sure. and that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I think that Zulkin. I mean, the idea of these gears turning mechanically is so unique. And really, the Mayan theme, or Aztec, whatever it is. I believe it's Mayan. Mayan, you know, these Mayan gears, stone gears turning. Like, that's pretty much the best that you're going to do. And sure. I think that's fine. Yeah, yeah. It didn't need to be anymore. And, and I don't think it tried to be anymore. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. So not thematic, dry. Yeah. But it works together the way it needs to work together. The theme doesn't get in the way. Yeah. I mean, I, and in some senses, I think it enhances it because it's, it's kind of unique. You're not, you know, it's not an emotional investment, but it's a it's a visually appealing connection. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the idea of like feeding your yeah. workers, I mean, corn can... and having different gods, you get the favor of in the crystal skulls and all that. Yeah, that's enough. Yeah, the, the, all those parts of the game just work together, and it's really unique and interesting. So, and that's what makes it a good game. Yeah, so maybe that's kind of the lesson, if you will, to get out of this is that, like with many things, you don't want one aspect of your creation to interfere with another. And so, games that are dry and that annoy in their dryness, I think, you know, maybe they're mechanically bad or mechanically uninteresting. That's one thing. But maybe in cases like Santorini, it just has an aspect that gets in the way of what the game is trying to be. Whereas right. in Tzolkin, right. it's yeah. everything's in service, and it's just... Yeah. It, it lets them do iconography really well, which is critical you know, in, in a consistent way. Yeah, so that, so it doesn't get in the way of things. It just services the dry game. Yes. Here's, a, here's an interesting example. What about Quantum? To me, I, that seems like an example of a game where ultimately the theme ends up obscuring the benefits of the game. Because ultimately, Quantum's an, ex an extremely abstract game to me, but it tries to do so much with the space theme that it creates a dissonance. I wouldn't agree. I would say it's a similarly abstract game as Santorini. It's kind of on that level. And I think it does a far better job of making sense. We have to disagree on that one, I think. It bugs me in, in Quantum, but that, that could be just me. 
Oh, there was another example I was going to bring up. Oh, we haven't talked about Dominion yet. And this is, I think, obligatory in this topic because a lot of people criticize Dominion for being too dry. And in Dominion, yes. you know, and it's ostensibly trying to be thematic. Like it has yeah. this theme of building a kingdom or well, building up your thing. One of my favorite axes to grind is that Dominion is wonderfully thematic. I love the theme in Dominion, and I think that they've done a great job, especially as the expansions have come out, of making it thematic. Well, here's, here's, but I would never argue that it's not dry. I kind of agree with you, Matt. Here's the difference to me. In Dominion, it is a very dry game. Like, it's yeah. very, very... It's yeah. Castles of Burgundy level dry. All, well, with sometimes little kind of Easter eggs yeah. of theme that yeah. pop up. Yeah. And I think, again, it works because... The thematic nature of it doesn't get in the way of the number crunching and heavy strategy. It just, if you notice it, it's there a bit on some, uh, on a good number of cards. Again, more than most people, I think, would assume who kind of dismiss it as, as not thematic. But a lot of the cards are really cleverly thematic. Yeah. Especially in the last, I'd say, what, four expansions or so? Yeah, I think. Like Adventures and Empires really, really. I think after it. the first couple, they have steadily become more and more thematic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and maybe subtle is is the most apt word for the theme of Dominion. <laughs> yeah, it is just you see it on the cards. I think when the game's over, you can kind of step back and see kind of on that big thematic arc level how your kingdom has evolved. And it's almost fun to tell the story. This particular kingdom you built with blacksmiths and tunnels and fool's gold or whatever. You know, that it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it, but you you can you can see the story, it, and and sometimes you get a really cool interaction with you know different cards have yeah. theme that riff on each other and stuff, whatever. But, it, but it's clearly done a lot in better the in a game, game play, like Suburbia, though. <laughs> yeah, for sure. In the gameplay itself, every decision is completely unattached to any element of theme. In in, in because yeah. of that, I would call it. A prototypical dry game. Yeah, I would agree there. I was interested. Go ahead. What do you think about Concordia? If we go through the same kind of process on Concordia. Oh, I think it's crazy dry. Yeah. Yeah. The same kind of thing. It's the theme doesn't get in the way at all. No. And it, it allows like to Zulkin for kind of a nice visually with component wise kind of a consistency across this kind of Mediterranean thing. But, uh, you know, it could be set anywhere. And they have released maps for other areas, other areas of the world i think there's a uk map or something like that that they've Is released still the greek gods that control the, the different point categories i think so yeah roman gods not greek oh yeah you know it could be said anywhere but but it I think... doesn't get in the way and i don't think there's really any relationship between like the gods listed on the cards and what they're incentivizing that i can think of yeah like it... there's nothing about jupiter that would that would want you to like go far and wide and like diversify exceed is an interesting one uh the exceed card game That's from level 99 fighting similar yeah the, where the card. theme is is basically street fighter it's a 2d fighting game and isn't it actually a 1d fighting game yes like it's played in one dimension it is a 1d fighting game it's a one-dimensional game the cards are two-dimensional obviously That's true but there's no jump the mechanics are actually one-dimensional yeah there we go it's a one-dimensional fighting game with many <laughs> dimensions of thought. But in the, in that game, like Dominion, it's a card game where you're just kind of crunching the numbers and looking th at the effects of the card. But in that game, it's more closely related to how you're playing a fighting game. Yeah, which is, no. You're trying to sneak in quick attacks before the other person to block the, their attacks yeah. mid-execution. And you're trying to kind of build up your your meter so you can execute special you know super attacks yeah no i think when you're looking at your cards you can immediately map what they do to the tactical level theme of of that street fighter and that's really cool i think when you play a combo of a couple cards you feel like a street fighter yeah or and so i think that's a good example of the idea that it's not just the mathematics or the crunchiness of the calculations that dictates whether or not a game is dry, which I think a lot of people mistake. Because yeah, to me, those perfect. two games are similar in terms of calculation, but perfect but Exceed is, is so much more 
dank. I'm sticking with it. I'm sticking with dank. <laughs> You're committing. Committing to it. The go-to example we usually say when we think of a thematic game is Star Wars Rebellion or uh, War of the Ring. And I think in those cases, the game is so much tied to the universe that you're playing in but like rebellion you could take that set of mechanics and do it something else you could put it in high fantasy or you could put it in you know pick another story or something but the game is so much about the theme just because every action is skinned with a character or an event or something and so everything is tied into that yeah and there and there aren't there's not many of those games. There's though. not many. Well, in spe- I think it's ha- it would be much harder to do for War of the Ring. I think War of the Ring is much more mechanically entwined with its narrative than than Rebellion is. In Rebellion, you don't have that many really Star Wars specific things. You have kind of the Death Star blowing up a segment of the board, which wouldn't plot over very well. But okay, but in like War of the Ring, I mean, half the game is just risk, more or less, right? Fair. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. That's. Like a, a, a yeah, that's fair. Better ver- or a bigger, you know, more, a, a more detailed version of Risk. Yeah, and it's the it's the cards and it's the fellowship track, and it's the the other parts of the game that make it so thematic and the map, of course. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, that's a good and, point. Yeah, in so generalizing from there, I think war games in general aren't aren't going to be dry. I think because no, yeah, because every decision you make is sending the dwarves to war or putting your d-day soldiers in a sacrificial place so war games could so naturally tie every decision mechanically to the theme well the war could games we say, generalize a little bit and just say a combat is a more emotional subject than engine optimization <laughs> yeah sure yeah you might say that but I think the key about war games is that they're largely very tied to the geographical setting. Yeah. Like chess right. is kind of a war game, right? right? Yeah. But it, you know, we've already discussed chess. Just takes place. On but the- like when you put up Memoir 44 and it's on Omaha Beach, it's thematic because of the geography and because of the historical setting. And because, and even if you can imagine a war game in a non-licensed kind of fictional universe, you know, generic space universe in its thematic you know think eclipse or, or twilight imperium it's thematic because of the the geographical and, and kind of fake historical trappings put on it well let's try to wrap this up i guess with some kind of basic ideas that we've talked about i think to me the dryness of the game is not necessarily a negative indicator for a game Agreed which I think we'd all agree with. A lot of people wouldn't agree with it, but I think for us at least, uh, we find the mechanisms of games, of, of really good games, to be so interesting that they can override any kind of thematic dryness. A second point I would argue is that if there is a deep connection between the theme and the mechanisms, that can certainly be a huge asset to a game. Agreed. Which I think we'd all agree with. And the third, and I think maybe the most interesting thing that we've come across during this discussion is going back to Orion's point that the mechanisms of the game and the theme shouldn't get in the way of each other. And the problems that emerge when you talk pejoratively about a dry game occur because they're in conflict. And I keep thinking of Tzolkin because that's such a unique case of such a vivid theme that, that has no connection really like the mechanics could be put in a a lot of different places but it managed to be interesting as kind of the aesthetics of the game and it doesn't get in the way is that kind of truths we can pull out of this i mean i i think a principle of good design is that the theme and the mechanics should work together and serve each other and that's easier said than done obviously but i think we can recognize that in a lot of good games where those two things do happen. Right. But I think it's beyond the idea that they should work together because again, going back to Dzulkan, they don't work together that well. Like you're, I mean, it's still I, I a dry mean in game. In the sense that like 
and the, action is skinned in a thematic way that makes it better. I mean, more or less what you said is that they serve each other. Yeah, or they don't get in the way of each other. For the sake of the experience playing the game. Right, right. And they both do a part to enhance that. Correct, yeah. Which I suppose is the hard part. <laughs> yeah. Of, of any kind of design. So, in addition to those, so I think, Mark, those are good truths that you have pulled out of our conversation. Welcome re- to another edition of Truths with Mark. <laughs> Wasn't that a thing at some that point thing. in college? They were yeah. all very benign truths. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a bunch of Facebook statuses I had. <laughs> truths. We all, like, multiple people had their own version. Like, Matt had true facts. Oh, and yeah. Had true truths. facts, yeah. And there was another one, but I don't remember what it was. <laughs> so, yeah, in addition to the truths with Mark, I like thinking about kind of the emotional engagement with a, a game, both in the large arc and decision to decision. That's a really good point. Yeah, so that, they're, they're often two very different things. Yeah, and I think that, that going forward, that could be a useful way to talk about theme. Whether it sticks to connect dryness with the decision to, to decision connection to theme, mm-hmm. you know, wh- whether or not that language sticks, making that distinction will be helpful. Well, there's two more things. One is that I'm really glad, looking back on our discussion here, I think it turned out really well. And I think it's it's always kind of scary going into <laughs> a subject so ostensibly dry as dryness. <laughs> And like yeah. the definition of a word, this is, I, but I think it's it's such a fun yeah. exercise when you don't get caught up in silly discussions of what a word yeah, right, actually means. Right. But cares? when you can take a concept and kind of dissect it apart exactly. and kind of try to rebuild it, I think those discussions are, are quite interesting, and they're not done very much. And maybe that's the most important life lesson so far is learn to get past silly disagreements to About to, word to, definitions to, yeah or whatever to ha- to have a, a larger discussion well there's the old philosophy joke where like i don't remember the specifics but it's like you know an engineer and a, a physicist and a grammarian and a bunch of people are arguing over something you know like what is what is the concept of time and and they finally turn it over to the philosopher and he just says it depends on how you define time <laughs> yeah <laughs> like it, and that just resolves it like there's so many arguments that get caught at that point of not resolving because no one's bothered to talk about the idea they're too stuck on this concept of the word uh, but when you when you're able to separate the idea and pull it apart and kind of look at it from different angles i think a lot of interesting thoughts can emerge i'm certainly going to be thinking about this podcast i think when i work on my designs that i'm planning to work on at some point <laughs> And then the final truth is that, according to a very trusted source on the internet, the opposite of dry is dank. That's dank, indeed. That's a this that's conversation, a... to our surprise, has turned out to be very dank. <laughs> so, if you could describe a uh, a game as both dank and thematic, I think we could uh, you could dive into it and have quite an experience. <laughs> I think that's going to be the end of the podcast. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out the website, thethoughtfulgamer.com. Please rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever you're listening to it from so we can get more exposure and, uh, you know, more uh, ratings, I guess. I guess they're their own end. Ratings of their own good? I don't no, know. No, no. They help with... They help with algorithms. Algorithms, getting the podcast out there. They really do. You know more about this than I do. Yeah, they really do. Cool. Maybe what you could do is is read some nice reviews on the podcast. Would, would people like that? That seems really egotistic. Yeah, probably not. They're all five-star reviews. I'll drop that in there. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> I, I, I've heard other review podcast people do that sort of thing, but... You know what? They're not you. So there are maybe... there are a bunch of really nice, friendly, encouraging reviews in there, which I've been yeah. very glad to see. Check me out on Twitter, on Facebook, and if you want to watch our podcast recordings live and interact with us, like I've been talking with Wes and Josh and Mark has been in here. The other, not me. I've you know I've been reading the, different. Mark. There's a different Mark. Don't worry about it. It's it's 
There are two of us. Check out the Patreon where you can watch the podcast live. You can join our discussions all throughout the weeks and the days on our Discord channel. Go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer and help us stay afloat financially. We would really appreciate that. Thanks for listening, everybody. We will be back next week with a continuation of my countdown of the top 100 games of all time. Another reason to look me up on social media is that I will be posting dates and times for us live recording that for the world. For the world. For the world that you can watch on stream. So be on the lookout for that. We'll be doing numbers 80 through 61. We'll talk to you all soon. Bye. Bye. Peace out.